thousands of private investors. In fact, if you look at the performance of his fantasy fund, you can only have one fund per kind of login uh, on uh, Stockopedia. He's ranked A star on a two and a three year basis, and uh, he returned over 200% in the last three years. His interests include classic cars, Margaret Thatcher, and cheese. <laughs> and, uh, the reason, I think the reason that people, people love Paul, and I think the reason they love him is not only his incredible talent for analysis, but his candor, his humor, his honesty, and his integrity. It is a great pleasure to introduce Paul Scott. <laughs> To say. Thanks, everyone. I, I bet some of you are actually thinking, oh, not this guy again. <laughs> um, I was chatting here this morning for about an hour, so obviously this is different material today. Um, firstly, though, thanks very much to David and Georgina and everyone else who's organised and participated in Mellow. Uh, the thing I find, it's such a refreshing change from other investor shows because of the quality of the companies presenting here, um, which is a real standout feature of Mellow. So, uh, I've mentioned before my own investing journey. Um, we, we covered this last night in an uh, informal session, but I appreciate there are a lot of, lots of people here who weren't here last night. Uh, my investing journey has been a, a, quite a roller coaster. Some wonderful profits in the bull market, um, but then a complete wipeout in 2008 caused by my making the mistake of um, too much gearing in illiquid stocks. And that's the point I always, always, always bang on about to everyone to warn you, you know, just don't end up doing what I did um, when the whole system collapsed in 2008. It's not the gearing on its own and it's not the illiquidity on its own that's the problem. But when the two are combined, it's absolutely uh, a toxic mix. Um, I've spoken about that extensively in the past and last night and I'm pleased to report that I've now settled all my old spread betting debts on payment plans recently settled five years early. So it's taken nearly 10 years but uh, uh, everything's fixed. And I should say that SpreadX, who are here today, uh, have been absolutely wonderful in helping me find a solution to what was a massive problem. At one point I owed them two million quid and I didn't have any assets. So this was a pretty serious problem but it got fixed. And I think the key thing to draw out from this, whatever mess people may get into in life, there's always a way out, you know? There's always a solution to all problems. Uh, it may take time and application, but uh, never give up if you do ever get into a, a disastrous situation. There's always a way out. Um, so SpreadX, I think, are great people and they provide an excellent service focused on small caps. Um, I want to make a few points about spread betting generally to start with. Now, I appreciate that this won't apply to a lot of people and I'm certainly not recommending spread betting. It's high risk and I think it's not for most people, but uh, there is uh, a place for it, I think, if you're experienced and you've got a strategy that works. Um, so, if you do decide to use a spread betting account, keep a tight control over that gearing. That is the big issue. I keep a spreadsheet where I, I work out exactly what the gearing is, and often you find you're far more highly geared than you realised you were. So, setting a limit, uh, a, good, a good point I think is say 1.5 times your equity. So, um, I, you know, if I were to open a new spread bet account and put 10 grand in it, I'd make sure that my underlying position value wasn't a above 1.5 times the equity and you, as long as that's spread over a few stocks that should be a reasonably okay uh, position in a bull market. Obviously in a bear market you don't want to be geared at all. Um, uh, so a key lesson I learned the hard way is not to oversize positions in illiquid stocks. My stuff is mainly small caps focused as you know. Uh, the big problem is when the market turns nasty you can't get out. Um, and that really changes risk reward because it's all very well everyone looking at, a, at the upside case but if something goes wrong and the company puts out a profit warning and you can't get out because the stock's so illiquid then that really affects what price we should be paying in the first place. We shouldn't be paying a P of 15 or 20 for a, a tiny obscure company. We should be really only buying them, I think, if they're, if they're dirt cheap. And I think at the moment a lot of micro caps are significantly overvalued. Uh, so if you're buying three or four grand's worth of these micro caps, you've actually got quite a good advantage because you can get out if you need to. But if you're taking position sizes of, I don't know, say 50 or 100,000 in each share in your portfolio, 
then micro caps uh, are very, very difficult because you just can't get out when you need to get out. Uh, okay, so these days I'm trying to stick to companies over about 50 million market cap. I just don't want to get stuck in these so-called lobster pot stocks that you can get into but you can't get out of. Preferably over 100 million market cap, but I will buy some of these smaller companies, the really tiny ones, if, uh, the, if the upside is really, really good. But I would position size that a lot smaller you know, maybe only a 20 or 30 percent of a normal position size if it's illiquid. So position sizing is different for everyone. Um, I just generally find it's better to just take a small slice of something if it's illiquid. Um, we've covered that. Oh, this is the other thing. Gearing's best avoided, as I say, I think, for most people, unless you're experienced. The other thing is having the self-discipline to avoid getting sucked into speculative trades where you've got no edge. So good examples is forex or indices trading. You know, I've, I couldn't tell you, I've done countless punts on indices, but I have no skill in that area. What the hell am I doing? You know, it's, 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 it's madness and it's gambling. You know, it's basically you become transfixed by all the flashing numbers and you see the Dow moving 700 points one way or another and you think, I want a slice of that. And sometimes you can make fabulous profits, but I think uh, over a lifetime it would have been heavily loss-making. So this is more a memo to self, a lot of this stuff. <laughs> okay. Uh... <clears throat> The other thing, yeah, just a couple of things that I've found useful for people who do spread, but I'll, I'll move on for the spread betting in a moment. The two things I've done to reduce the risk. Firstly, I got SpreadX to disable the dealing platform, so I can't place trades online. They have to be done by phone. I put a second, that's just a firewall that stops you doing anything impulsive, perhaps. The other uh, firewall is that I use an intermediary broker called Patronus Partners, who sit between me and SpreadX, and I actually have to ring them up. They then work the trade, so they buy, the, it's, a, it's quite complex the way it all goes through. But I get all the benefits of using a, uh, a proper broker who get me really keen prices, and they then pass it over to SpreadX, who turned it into a spread bet. It's, it's a great hybrid of, um, you get obviously the tax-free uh, status of spread bets, which is the main reason for using them. It's like a bucking bronco, if you can, can control it, and maybe not many people can, but if you can, it's a very, uh, it can be very good. So, moving on from that, it's easy to make money in bull markets. The hard bit is hanging on to that money when the market turns bearish. So, that concludes that section. So, moving on to small cap stock picking, which is the main thing I wanted to talk to you about. What I've been doing after David told me about Mellow Derby, I've just been jotting down brief notes in the back of my sort of uh, notepad about interesting investing themes, example of companies where I've spotted something good or bad, and I've got about 20 of these to run through today, which I've separated into opportunities and threats. So if we start with opportunities, the first one is, uh, and I'm sorry I haven't done slides, but I will publish all these notes. So, I mean, it's up to you if you want to drop things down, but if not, I'll, I'll make these notes available to everyone. The first opportunity I look for when I read RNSs is companies that are expanding into new markets or with new products. This can be a really powerful way of improving your returns. Something that caught my eye the other day was Tops, Tops Tiles, uh, ticker TPT. It's not a stock I actually own personally, but it's on my watch list. And I wrote about this in the Small Cap Valley Report on the 4th of April this year. Now, what jumped out at me from this trading update, which is it wasn't a great trading update, their sales had, uh, the Q2 sales had dropped, and as you can see, the share price has been quite soft lately. But they said that they're looking at doubling the size of its addressable market. At the moment, it's retail focused. What they're looking at doing is branching out into commercial, commercial tiling. Now, that I think is something that sounds really interesting. Obviously, it's not going to happen overnight. But looking at the valuation metrics, a, P, a forward P of 10.2, dividend yield of nearly 5%. Uh, the balance sheet's not too bad. There's a bit of debt. Uh, but I, I like the fact that, that that company is looking to double its addressable market, given that it operates successfully in one market and it's holding its head above water in, in a very difficult retail uh, uh, environment. So that, I think, is an interesting company. As I say, I haven't bought it yet, but it's on my radar. 
Uh, Somero Enterprises is another one, uh, S-O-M, the ticker. Now this is an American based company which is listed in the UK, which seems odd, but it's been listed in the UK I think for about 10 or 12 years. Management are very good, they come over here regularly. Um, it makes laser guided con concrete screeding material, so it makes perfectly flat floors for warehouses, which is again a cyclical market that's really going in their favour because increasingly e-commerce web uh, websites and warehouses are now stacking the, the pallet up, they're going higher. So you have a slight imperfection in the concrete floor and all these racky, racks will you know, be badly out of alignment with potentially disastrous results. So a cyclical uh, growth company I think, the, everybody fixates over the fact that their market dried up in 2008, but 2008, I mean who knows if it was a one-off or not, but credit just stopped, construction stopped. Are we going to get into that sort of serious situation again? I don't know, but all I know is that you know, in other countries now they're expanding into um, uh, countries all over the world and they are by far the market leader in this sector. And as you can see, I mean, um, now that's uh, trailing 12 month figures. So I think the forward PE is actually lower, it's about 14 or something. So uh, very high stock rank as well. So even though it's gone up a lot, you know, it's difficult to buy into things that are, are that strong. But this stock hasn't sold off and in the last three or four months we've seen loads of small cap stock sell off. This one hasn't, so I think it's a very interesting company. I love the management as well, they're so down to earth. Uh, they're really, I think, just genuine people. But, so that's point one, new markets and new products. And they're also introducing uh, smaller machines to do um, perfectly flat floors in multi-storey buildings. So again, they're expanding their market in, with new products as well. Um, <clears throat> E-commerce companies are an, another good examples of uh, companies which are expanding into new markets and products. So the three standout ones are obviously ASOS, uh, I'm currently shorting that because I think it's too expensive. Boohoo, where I've got a long position, it's been a very, very good investment. And Gear for Music. Um, they all look very expensive, but when you understand the growth and the long term, sort of where they're getting to, it becomes a lot more sensible, the valuation, I think. Now, uh, when these e-commerce companies, companies start to crack overseas markets, that's when you get a, a, a potentially massive re-rating of the shares. I mean, if you take Gear for Music, that was G4M, the ticker. Now this one, um, I think I mentioned last night, this one paid for my flat. Um, and so I have a, a, a framed photograph of management behind my front door. Um, <laughs> now, so we've, we've missed the, the real zoom up because that's the one year chart. It, 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 could you click on the all thing just above the chart? To, uh, okay. Yeah. Now that shows you the effect of a serious re-rating. Now in 2015, 2016, this thing just chugged along. Market cap was about 20 million. Everyone just, including myself, I wrote in the Stockopedia reports, it's just a low margin box of shifter. All they're doing, it sells musical instruments and audio products and I thought, it's no good, it doesn't make any money, you know, it's just chugging along, people will just buy off Amazon and all the rest of it. Well anyway, then there was a game changing announcement in September 2016 and I remember looking at this thing and thinking, oh hell, that's interesting. And what it was, it was organic growth of over 70% in sales. Well, something's happening if a company can deliver that sort of organic growth. So I really s sat up and took notice and uh, luckily bought, bought as many as I could get after that first initial rise. Um, and look what happened. You know, people th initially thought, oh, it's a, a speculative bubble, you know, the shares will drift off again. But actually, it's remained remarkably strong because people are seeing this thing as a niche business. Amazon are not particularly interested in stocking 30,000 slow moving lines. But these guys, uh, you know, source their own product from China, which has taken them years to do. Uh, again, the margin's low, but you look forward several years and you look at the com competition. This thing's trouncing the competition and uh, it's rapidly uh, taking market share from physical retailers and other online musical instrument retailers. So even though the forward PE of 62 looks madness, um, you look five years out and that's... I think will be a substantially larger business. I've sold about three quarters of mine, but I've still got a, a, a reasonable holding in that. 
Right, the next theme, number two, is closure of loss-making subsidiaries. Now, most companies, even quite small stock market shares, are actually groups of companies, as you know. So we tend to see them just as a single entity. Often they're not. Now, what I look for when I'm reading the trading updates, I look for uh, groups which have a highly profitable core business, but that's somehow obscured by them doing all sorts of other things which lose money. And it's surprising how often you find this. Um, now, the beauty of the, the reason I look for those type of situations is that the bad bits can be sold off or closed down. All you need is a management that recognises that what, whatever they're doing that's losing money isn't, isn't viable, and it can cause a dramatic uh, increase in profitability if they go down that route. Now, a great example of this, which we, I don't think we can show because the company delisted a couple of years ago, was called Avesco. Um, now, this did these, those large TV screens for sporting events, you know, outdoor sporting type things. Now, it looked a fairly dull business, but again, if you read the back of the accounts where it has the sector breakdown of the various activities, you found that it had this fabulous business in America, which was hugely profitable, but then it had subsidiaries in other countries that were losing money. Put the total together and it wasn't that great. Well. They then started um, sorting the group out. There was also a great ton of free uh, freehold property in this one, which the market ascribed no value to. Now, the big opportunity was that they could sell the US business for multiples of what the whole group was worth, and that's exactly what happened. Um, I was buying uh, at around £1.20 a share. I had to wait, I think, two or three years but the £1.20 turned into £6.50 cash bid for the whole group. And quite a few of my uh, Stockopedia report readers uh, also did very well on that. So I was thrilled that uh, we all did very well on it. But it was in plain sight, the upside. This is the thing. You didn't have to really have any particularly, do anything particularly clever. It, the, the value was obvious um, if you just drilled into the numbers in a bit of detail. Uh, now, obviously it's all very well talking about the past, but what about now? Well, I've spotted something a bit similar to this. Um, I don't think it's going to have the same upside as Avesco, but this is a tiny floor coverings company called Area. This is A-I-E-A, -E -A, the ticker. Now, this is hideously illiquid, this share, so it's probably more of for general interest rather than actually being able to buy the shares, and I hold, I hold this one personally. Now. It's got, um, as you can see, it's shot up quite a lot. Um, the reason for that is because they've just announced that they're going to close its heavily loss-making carpets business, which has a turnover of about 10 million a year and loses 3 million a year. So the group as a whole makes about 1 million a year. So once you get rid of the carpets bit, the rest of the group is fantastically profitable. It makes about a 17% operating profit margin. Um, and that's obviously what caused that uh, jump in, in, in uh, share price recently. But the thing is, it's only valued at 21 million even after that. And they've just paid out a, a 5p special dividend. Um, now, I bought them about a year and a bit ago at 30p. So I've had 6 or 7p in dividends in a year which is astonishing, isn't it? I mean, that wasn't foreseeable. It was more luck than judgment, to be honest. But um, the, the downside risk with this one is it does have a um, pension deficit. Actually, could we go to investigate and look at their for area and look at their announcements? I think you already had them on one of the tabs, didn't you? So AIE, that's it. Now, the key announcements here, um, if you look at the proposed closure of Rylux, so that was, again, I rummage around with all these obscure companies, and you just occasionally find something really interesting like this, where they announced uh, in, what's that, 20th, 20th March, they said, oh, we're going to close this carpets business because it's loss-making, but they didn't give the figures. So the first thing I did was I read, went to the... Um, the previous annual report, which obviously you can get very easily these days uh, on the company's websites. And I nearly fell off my chair when I saw just what a huge impact this is going to have on the overall figures. And what makes it even better is that um, they've said that the closure of the carpet business will actually be cash flow positive. So they're going to sell off the machinery, they're going to liquidate the inventories and the receivables, and they'll use that to pay this special dividend. Now, obviously, you know, you feel for the employees and so on, and want to revel in businesses being closed, but um, 
I think they did say they were going to offer jobs to everyone in other parts of the group. Um, so this type of thing is, is, is a really nice special situation, I think, where uh, it, it's completely off the radar for most people, but if you were able to nip in there early on and, and hoover up some shares in it, you know, you'll do very well. Uh, where it goes from here, I don't know, because they've also announced recently that James Halstead, is it, I think, are, m are mooting a bid for the whole group. So it could fall back from here if we get an announcement saying, you know, James Halstead had decided not to buy it, then this could. So be aware that there is the risk of this having a sharp pullback. But I think that I personally would be buying more if that happens because I think once the losses disappear, you're going to see this, uh, what is actually a very nice, high quality, profitable business. Um, linked to this, theme number three is owners retiring. Um, now, this was the case with Avesco. And again, you can find this out very easily from looking up the shareholder list. And you ideally want to see companies with maybe directors holding, I don't know, 20% plus. Um, particularly if it's a founder, CEO or chairman who's getting on a bit, they want to retire at some point. And you can get all that from Google. So with Avesco, Richard Murray, who was called with the chairman, and to a lesser extent the other directors, they owned a third of the business. Now, he, I googled him and he was in his, I think, early 70s. It was pretty clear from the things he was doing to the business, selling off this subsidiary, closing down that subsidiary, it was pretty obvious he was preparing it for a, a sale. Um, now, again, that's happened, so it's no good going over that. So I've been looking for similar situations, and the one I think is, look, looks remarkably similar to that in principle is French Connection. Now, you know, collective groan, I've been going on about this for five years, um, but I, I do think this is now nearing the end game. Now, the ticker here is FCCN. Ah, oh, you got it, great. Now, again, similar chart action, these vertical moves up mean there's been some sort of game-changing news. Now, if we could go to the Investigate page for this one, please. Um, the news flow here were, really began on the uh, preliminary results on the 13th of March. Now, buried in that announcement is, almost as an, uh, as an aside, it says, oh, we had a bid approach last year from an, un, from, an, from an American company. We spent several months evaluating it. We incurred 0.8 million in fees, which is a bit annoying, uh, and the bid fell through. Now, what that telegraphs to the world is, we're up for sale. It also says the chairman, Stephen Marks, who owns 42% of the company, and amazingly, he founded French Connection in the early 70s. So it's his life's work. He, he, he's in his 70s, as I say. Clearly, he's, he's, he's minded to, or open-minded to retiring and selling the business. And again, you're starting to see them tidying up the group. There was another uh, RNS, if we could go back to the... Uh, previous page, um, sorry, no, on, on investigate, if we could do back to the list of uh, RNSs, that's it. So if you look here, um, and this came as a complete surprise on the um, 9th of April this year, proposed sale of toast to bestseller. Now I'd forgotten that French Connection even owned toast, it was a small chain of about 20 uh, ladies were shops. And they just announced here that they're going to get net uh, of minorities and costs. French Connection's going to get 13.9 million in cash. Now bear in mind, I think when that was announced, French Connection's entire market cap was only about 40 million. And most people, myself included, just had, uh, had disregarded Toast and thought it was, it was worth nothing. Now, the other thing there is I, I started Googling who bestseller are, the, the people who are buying Toast. Turns out it's a massive group with thousands of shops based in Denmark that's got, I think, about a thousand shops in China, for example. It's a huge fashion group. So you start thinking, don't you, well, hang on, they bought that lump of French Connection. They've obviously got a close relationship with French Connection. What are the odds that once Stephen Marks has tidied up the group, they come back and bid for the whole of French Connection? So I think we're starting to put things together here and seeing that there's going to be uh, potentially some really good upside on French Connection. Now, the, what, what's even better is that 
uh, French Connection is closing down its loss-making shops. So it has a lot of heavily loss-making shops. Its retail division loses 8.3 million a year. The whole group would have gone bust years ago if it wasn't for the fact that it has a wholesale division that makes it doing really well, makes 12.5 million a year profit, and also it has brand licensing which makes 6.3 million a year profit. And then there's 10 million central costs which are far too high and could be reduced by an acquirer. Um, and now as the leases are expiring and there's only 2.9 years left on the average lease, um, the losses are falling quite rapidly on the retail division and should essentially disappear over the next few years. So the, uh, again the results uh, on Mar in March this year showed that they're almost at break even now and the outlook statements from him were the most bullish I've heard in years. He's basically saying, you know, we're on our way, we're going to move into profit this year. So you've got a good business there, irrespective of whether or not there's a bid for it. Now, the even better thing is if you look at its balance sheet, the market cap is currently the same as its own working capital. It has no debt, so you are totally copper-bottomed with the current share price in terms of it's 100% backed by liquid assets. Um, so every angle on it, I think, is covered. The only downside I can see on this is if it's just dead money for a year or two. You know, if we, if we take a position in it and then nothing happens. So, it, it, but, you know, if you want something that, where risk-reward is that good, that, that's uh, a price, a risk worth taking, I think. So I think this is now looking close to the end game for French Connection. Personally, I can't see him selling it for below a quid a share. And you can buy now at 50p. Um, and there's essentially no downside. Okay, um, that covers groups being prepared for sale. Uh, structural growth markets is my fourth uh, s uh, general theme. Now, any company that's in a growing market, basically. So, I mean, a great example, I looked at Clipper Logistics this week. I don't know how many of you know that one. It looks a really interesting company. It's not one I, I hold personally, but I wish I had, because it's a, a picks and shovels business for e-commerce companies. It provides outsourced warehousing, logistics, dispatch, even returns management of re customer returns. And because e-commerce generally in Britain is growing very fast, so 20 odd percent or more per annum, Clipper Logistics are just in a great place where their clients do 20% or more, more business pretty much automatically every year. So um, it's a lovely, the graphs of the company's performance reflect that. It's just a sort of 45 degree line up in terms of revenues and profit. The trouble is they're not cheap things like this. It's on a PE of sort of 24 or something, but you know, if you want a good business, you've got to pay up for it, I think. Um, theme number five is sector re-ratings. Uh, I've touched on this already with the e-commerce companies. Um, now, at one point, Boohoo warned on profits shortly after it floated, and the, uh, the, the shares halved to 23p, and it was on a forward PE of 20 at one point. Now, that just didn't make sense if you compared it with ASOS that was on a PE of about, I think, about 80 at the time. So there was a clear mismatch where uh, Boohoo had just disappointed in the short term. Um, so I think if I spot something in a growth market that's had some sort of wobble, but it's uh, a transitory thing, you know, there's, it's some short-term problem that they can fix, you can, you can suddenly find the stock will re-rate after a few months to sort of catch up with the, the rest of the sector. Um, interesting thing as well, uh, Boohoo put out results this week which were stunning, absolutely fantastic. I've known, um, so Boo, B O O on that one. So now this one's been pulled down with the whole retail sector, uh, peaking at 260, 270 a year ago, and it dropped down to below 150 recently, um, and it shot up. I, oh, I covered this this morning, didn't I? I won't, I won't dwell on that. Um, one thing I think I forgot to mention this morning, I listened to the management conference call, which is about an hour that was on the internet the other day, and management are just brimming with confidence. You know, this business is absolutely... Uh, cooking on gas. Now, I think one of the reasons the shares are cheap is because of GDPR, this uh, general data protection regulations that are coming in very soon, 19th of May, I think, um, which is causing chaos with companies that have large email lists and the, 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 they're having to potentially see those lists decimated if they can't get customers to opt in. Now, what's interesting with Boohoo is from the management call, they've got an incredibly engaged um, customer base. Their annual churn of customers is only 13%. So they put their customers into tranches and say, right, these people shopped with us first in 2016. So of every 100 of those, 87 of them 
we're still active customers the following year, and whatever 13% or 87 is, we're still the next year. So these are people who want to be engaged with Boohoo. They're not people who, um, you know, just buy one item and then never return. So I waited and waited for the analysts to ask questions about GDPR in the Q&A on uh, Boohoo's conference call. Not a single analyst asked the question. This seems to me the most obvious question. So luckily, um, in a previous guise, Boohoo used to be the biggest supplier to the retailer which I was FD for. So I, I texted one of the directors and said, um, nobody asked about GDPR, aren't you worried about it? I'm going to get into terrible trouble for saying this, but I got the reply came, what's GDPR? <laughs> <laughs> um, edit that out of the video. Uh, so I then explained, oh, it's these new regulations. He said, oh, yeah, we're all over it. We're all over it. And uh, I said, we're not worried about it. You know, our customers love uh, dealing with us, want to have contact with us. It's not going to affect our business in the slightest. He says, we're not worried about it in the least. So I think that could be providing a... Um, a buying opportunity maybe for uh, companies that have got really savvy marketing departments, you know, and find in innovative ways of getting their customers to engage. For example, uh, Instagram seems to be the big, big, big channel for fashion retailers now. Uh, and I believe they were saying on, the, on that conference call that customers can actually now buy uh, Boohoo products through Instagram directly. So I think email is going to decline in importance as a marketing tool, but the, the companies who really get how to engage with their customers, it shouldn't affect them that much. Might do temporarily, but I think uh, any blip in prices is a buying opportunity. Uh, okay, now... Um, oh, the other thing, all these high growth companies, to bear in mind, because I was talking about sector ratings, eventually the high growth companies will derate. So, and I think we can all get into a mindset of thinking, oh, a PE of 60 or 70 is reasonable for a particular company. But that is based on the, the fact that the market is expecting hyper rates of growth. And we all know you can't grow compound at 50 or 100% per annum. It tails off, doesn't it, to 25, 20, whatever. And um, it's important to remember, I think, that the PEs will, will come down as well. So a good example of that is Just Eat which not long ago was on a P of 50 or 60. If you if follow that stock, you probably noticed that uh, the Ford P now has dropped about 35 because the business is, is maturing now. Um, but it's been a, you know, a very successful uh, share, that one. So um, ASOS, I think, is a sitting duck for a D rating. It's still rated at 60 or 70 times. I have no idea why, because I don't think it deserves a rating anywhere near that high and I'm, hence I'm shorting the stock. Theme number six, strong balance sheets. Now, surprisingly few investors, even institutions, take much notice of the balance sheet. Now, I think that provides an opportunity because if a company's got a strong balance sheet with lots of cash and hopefully no debt, then it's not only a safe uh, investment and it can survive a downturn in trade without having to worry about raising more equity and diluting people and so on, or the bank pulling the plug like effectively that they did at Conviviality. Um, but also I find the market often doesn't really price in the surplus cash. So if you target companies with a really strong balance sheet, sometimes you're getting the cash more or less free. And that, that provides nice upside because the company might then use that cash to make an acquisition which boosts earnings and all of a sudden you know your shares have gone up 10 or 20 percent and that could be free upside or you might get a special dividend which uh, comes through every now and again so i really love companies with strong balance sheets that's probably my single biggest uh, focus in my investing strategy one of my readers flagged up to me a company called headlam uh, ticker h-e-a-d now this one's, uh, so funnily enough, another floor coverings business. Um, now I thought, oh God, it looks so boring, I can't motivate myself to look at it. But uh, I eventually did and discovered that you've got a nice low PE there of 9.97, you've got a 6.1% dividend yield um, in a business that's very financially strong. It's got a lovely balance sheet and you can see that quickly from the price to book value uh, just there of 2.1. Now that's very low. And I had a look at the balance sheet and I thought, blimey, this thing's been very acquisitive over the years, but it's still got loads of cash in the bank, lots of surplus working capital. 
And funnily enough, in the floor coverings business, Victoria Group, who I'm sure you've heard of, have gone on an amazing uh, acquisition splurge. They often target businesses with, with surplus working capital because they can strip that out and it and ends up paying for a lot of the acquisition. So I think this one's really interesting. I've only got a few of these, uh, but I think this one's worth a look because it's so financially strong. Um, and uh, yeah, so that's uh, a good one. Now the three balance sheet tests, which I think I covered this morning, so I won't revisit this, but eligible asset value must be positive. The current ratio, I want that to be over 1.3, and net debt, net debt must be modest. And I think just those three quick checks, you can check that in a minute or two. It amazes me the number of people who will put, say for example, 30 grand into a share like Conviviality without even checking its balance sheet. <laughs> and lose the money within one day. <laughs> so it's when you break, the, break your own rules that things go wrong. Um, now, uh, theme number seven, tax cuts in America. Um, this is probably already in the price now for a lot of shares, but quite often with small caps it may not be if there's not really any broker coverage. So it's worth considering looking at um, UK-based groups that have a lot of uh, American earnings. For example, Somero, the one I mentioned earlier, where I, I have a long position, they recently said in an announcement their tax rate will fall from 33% in 2016 to 21%. That's a hell of a drop. And obviously earnings and earnings per share are post-tax. So that gives a step jump of quite a bit to their earnings. Um, may not be fully in the price, I don't know. Now moving on to threats. First one um, threat is high operating margins. Now, conventional wisdom is we all tend to think of high operating profit margin as being uh, a sign of quality. Um, but I, I'm starting to change my view on this a bit because, I mean, I normally look for an operating profit margin of about 10%. I think that's high enough to mean it's a good quality business, but not, not so high that it attracts competitors. Now, the one which has attracted competition, of course, is Pat Butcher's mob. Well, I don't know if you've seen the tea adverts. She's now selling double glazing online. And uh, they're muscling in on Safe Style, which has put out a series of, I think, a ticker Safe Style. I think it might just be Safe. SFE. SFE. Thank you, sir. Now, this looked a great quality business that had re a really good operating profit margin. But recently, you can see what's happened. I mean, three pounds down to 56p in a year for a business that had a lovely operating margin that was shown there as 8.7%, um, high return on capital employed. You know, the quality metrics are really good. So I'm flagging this because I think we need to maybe um, just be a bit careful about um, new entrants coming in and, and eating someone else's lunch if they're making a bit too much profit. And I think it was Wheelie Dealer, who um, a lot of us follow on um, Twitter, he made a great point on this. He said, it's fine having a high um, operating profit margin, but you've got to have some sort of economic moat as well that prevents other people just setting up shop and copying you. Whereas actually double glazing is one of the easiest things to copy. You just, it, it's essentially just a sales operation, and then you can have all the manufacturing outsourced to uh, a company like Epwin, for example. So SafeStyle didn't really have a moat, and that's probably why the owners wanted to cash in and float it. <coughs> I'm, I'm surprised you say that because usually it would be regarded that a high operating margin would be regarded as, as an, an indicator there is a high uh, competitive moat. It's, it's usually when there's a, a high return on capital employed but a low mm. operating margin that, that people say is, is a warning sign. Yeah, no, I mean, uh, yes, I mean, uh, well, I mean, I, I, I don't know really how to, to reiterate it. I mean, all I can say is these guys are making tons of money and somebody else spotted it and set up in competition. So, you know, it's the lack of... The, it's the because that's not particularly high, although it's not... Uh, I think it was a bit higher than that maybe a year or two back, but, you know, the, the, the point is you've got to have the moat. If you've got high margins and you've got a great moat and competitors can't join you, I think, but, but normally I would say, yes, operate, high operating margin is good if you've got a moat. You must forgive me, I'm Paul Ashby. Please don't uh, to ask for no questions during the presentation. Please oh, it doesn't matter. We'll I for, forgot we'll, to say that. We'll forgive him. Um, and it's because we can't get my <laughs> student, people can't hear you at the back, so do forgive me for that. Alright, thank, no thanks, thanks Richard. Right. Don't worry, no hard feelings. Um, <laughs> so, right, uh, I think we've touched on this already, but my, this is the, in the threats section. Microcap illiquidity. 
uh, the, the liquidity is never there when you need it. Uh, I've already covered this actually. It's just basically, you know, I'm reluctant to buy tiny companies because I can't get out if something goes wrong. So actually what I did in January and February this year when the market as a whole, do you remember whether there was that really sudden massive wobble, wasn't there? Which was extraordinary really. The US markets had just been doing that. VIX, I mean I don't really follow it, but it was incredibly low. And then all of a sudden, just out of the blue, after years of steady rises, it just went did all this type of thing. Well that really gave me a... Um, uh, a jolt out of my complacency. So I went through all my portfolio and the te to look at cutting back and getting some of the gearing out of the system. Um, now, the, the temptation is when, when you, you hit a period like that of volatility, the temptation is to just start banking your profits on the winners, isn't it? And I'm sure we could all see a lot of people doing that. A lot of the high momentum stocks suddenly, you know, dropped 30, 40, even 50% in the last few months. Uh, and I did take profits on some of those, I must admit. But mainly I went through all the uh, stuff at the bottom of the portfolio, the illiquid stuff, and just Took a, took a knife to it and just chopped a lot of it out. In some cases, even quite small positions took several days to, to sell. And I thought to myself, well, I'd rather get rid of them when the market is okay-ish rather than become a, becoming a forced seller uh, when the market, if the market really tanks. Um, and this takes me on to the fact that the next theme is that prices for the smallest companies are actually completely artificial. You don't have a liquid market, therefore you've got backed up sellers or backed up buyers who can't trade. So actually all the share price is doing is reflecting what the smallest uh, transactions are doing. Behind that you could have a gigantic wall of potential demand or supply that isn't reflected in the prices and the market maker quotes are quite often total fantasy. There's no meaningful bid. Uh, you can only maybe sell a thousand pounds of something. If you want to sell £100,000 of it, you might have to take half the current market price. So I think we need to be very, very careful with the smallest end of the market to not actually, you know, to see those prices for what they are. They're kind of rigged, they're kind of artificial. And the higher, the more liquid a stock becomes, the more meaningful the price becomes because buyers and sellers can, can all transact when they want to. Um, so uh, that's why I use a proper broker for my microcap trades. So the, the proper broker will ring up the market makers, you know, sniff out what the lie of the land is. If uh, very often there'll be bids well within the, you know, near, near or even above the mid price, and you can't, you don't really know what's going on unless I think you can have a proper broker finding out the real prices that are behind these artificial prices on our screen. Um, now, when a big holder wants to sell in a, in a tiny microcap, the stock often has to be placed in a secondary placing where a bro the house broker usually will, will try and drum up buyers for it. Now, there was one example of this recently who I think are here, so I've got to be uh, uh, careful what I say, but a company called ImageScan. Now, um, the, the, the shares went up on a series of very good um, updates last year, and the price went up to about 11p. And then um, my broker rang me up and asked if I wanted to be taken inside on something, so I said yes. Uh, there was a secondary placing going on at 8p. Now I thought, well, that's a good deal, isn't it? Getting it, you know, 3p cheaper than 11p. So I bought some, thinking I was being, buying clever, being clever. But, but the price very f soon, in literally a couple of days, fell below 8p and then carried on going down. I think ended up about 5p. So I think whenever there's and a similar thing happened a few years ago with Space and People, ticker SAL. Some of you might know that one, very small company. It was about a pound, and um, a secondary placing became uh, available at 86p. Nice discount. I thought it, the figures looked great, and so on. So I bought some. Anyway, it wasn't long before uh, the bad news started coming out, and it dropped to about 20p uh, over a period of time. Now, the point I want to make on that is that when a big seller comes into the market, even if they're offering the stock at a discount, it can quite often mean they know something's not right behind the scenes, you know. They may not know specifics, but they probably know more than I do. And also, I think when discounted shares filter their way down to me, uh, that probably means that the people in the city uh, know it's a dud. <laughs> and if it comes to pond life like me, <laughs> it's crap, usually. <laughs> um, there are always exceptions, these are just my experiences. Um, okay, uh, GDPR impact we've covered. 
So I think the GDPR thing could be actually an opportunity, although it might cause some sharp sell-offs and things if individual companies in May suddenly say, oh, we haven't thought about this, we've lost half our customers or so on. So I'm, I, I'm not quite sure how we handle GDPR at the moment, but it's some, it, it could be a, a, a significant issue shortly. Uh, I've shorted two stocks, Communisys and Dot Digital. Dot Digital is an email marketing company, and I thought, well, if email is going to be, become far less important as a marketing tool, then probably shorting a company that's highly rated and does email marketing software might be a good idea. But so far, it hasn't worked. But uh, we'll see what happens on that. It was rather embarrassing, actually, last week at UK Investor Show. Everyone burst out laughing when I said I'd shorted Communisys. And I said, you know, what's the joke? And it turns out that Ed, my boss at Stockopedia, had just given it as one of his top five long positions for the year. <laughs> <laughs> so uh, that was slightly embarrassing. OK, um, low interest rates. Now, this is my next theme uh, of pot potential threat. I think one of the key things we've got to think about, you know, having these low interest ra rates now for a very, very long time has caused overinvestment and misallocation of capital in lots of sectors I think and we haven't really seen that wash out yet uh, there's clearly been an asset bubble because if people can borrow very very cheaply on margin they're going to chase up asset prices so we've, we've seen a lot of that particularly shares and bonds and so on um, but I think in certain sectors like restaurants and shopping malls, even hotels, you've seen so much new capacity come in because people have started building all these new sites. A lot of private equity money has gone into casual dining sector and the capacity has gone up about 40%, I believe, in the last 10 years. Well, now overcapacity is, is a real problem and the restaurant sector is brutal at the moment. Uh, where I think you, 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 the one question really now to ask retail and hospitality companies is how long are your property leases? That's the key thing. If they've got short leases, they can just walk away when the lease expires, hand it back to the landlord. It's the landlord's problem then who has to then let it on to someone else, probably on a massively reduced rent and probably having to give them a large cash bung as well, a reverse premium, as it's called, or a long rent-free period. But if you're tied into really, really long leases and you're paying far too much rent now on these things because there's too much competition, you're in a real mess. And what we're starting to see is CVAs, creditor voluntary arrangements, a sort of insolvency light, if you want to call it, type of arrangement. And now I think going to become very common this year. We've all already heard from carpet right um, David I know has been shorting carpet right for what is it ten years or something so I think <laughs> eight, years. eight years and um, it, it, so it, it stayed at a, a, just the wrong valuation for well eight years and now it's come almost down to zero um, but the funny thing is with a CVA the, the business can continue trading as normal but it can walk away, if the landlords agree to it, they can then walk away from all their loss-making um, sites and just hand them back and get rent reductions on the, on the rest. So a CVA actually is rewarding failure in a way, and it's, um, it puts businesses which have failed, or almost failed, into a, a, a fabulous position compared with their competitors afterwards. So it'll be very interesting to watch Carpet Right and what the share price does. Because the, the process now is that the CVA has to be agreed by the landlords. Then, if that's approved, um, they will do a, a refinancing, a placing, to raise the money to fund the CVA, because obviously you have to pay the landlord something to, to let you off the hook. Um, right, number 10, I've just called permanent overhangs. Now, going back to the previous point, small caps are not liquid. So, you can end up with just this permanently backed up wave of sellers who sell on the on every uh, piece of good news. Um, so I think it's worth running through the holding in company RNSs to see what the biggest shareholders are doing. An example of that recently was Game Digital, ticker GMD. Now this one again, I uh, disclose, I, I have a long position in this. Now the biggest shareholder in it owned about 40% of the company, 4-0, and they were putting out these RNSs saying, you know, they were dribbling out stock into the market, maybe they dropped by 1%, and you think, Christ, you know, 40% holder clearly wants out, the market just will stand back and watch and wait for the price to go down and down and down. And that's what happened in January when the, these RNSs started coming out. It just, it just tanked. Now, the recent burst up was caused by 
Um, the uh, secondary placing, clearing that shareholder out altogether. And people like Gervais Williams, who's here uh, today at, at Mighton, picked up about 13%, I think. So this has transformed the shareholder base of this company now from one where you have this massive overhang to one where you now, that's gone completely, it's all been placed, and you now have new enthusiastic holders of the stock. Now that, to me, transforms the potential outlook for the, uh, for the share price movement. So I think this one's very interesting. It's also trading below its own net cash, which is a bit bizarre. It's a special situation there, uh, closing large numbers of their existing stores because all the leases are expiring this year. And they've done a deal with Sports Direct that owns 30% of the company to take uh, sort of mezzanine floor store within a store within Sports Direct. And they're going to be doing gaming as more of a um, leisure activity rather than making money selling the games. So the whole business model is changing and I don't think the market has picked up on that yet. So I, I, I like that one but it's, it, it is speculative and I recognise it won't appeal to everyone. Um, now point 11, the director's comments and outlook statements. I just want to make a few comments on this. What I like to do is look at the track record of each individual company. Um, you've got to be an optimist to be a uh, chief executive of a small cap company, Every, everyone knows that. But when reading the updates, I like to look back at what they said previously, you know, read the Outlook com comments going back two or three years. Um, do, they, do they serially over-promise and under-deliver? Or are they prudent and they tend to outperform? That to me is a, is a very key distinction and obviously we're looking for the latter. Uh, the other thing is, I think, with directors, people always say, oh, what should you do about directors buying or selling shares in their own company? And I think it's very difficult because the directors of Conviviality spent about 600 grand buying shares in the company just a few weeks before it went bust. And people I know who've, who met them at the, 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 um, the aborted fundraising said, you know, they had no idea that group was heading for disaster, genuinely. They didn't understand their own cash flow, they didn't have proper controls over it, they thought everything was fine. So directors don't necessarily know what's going on if they have a sort of, particularly if they've done a lot of uh, acquisitions quickly as Conviviality did. So is director buying a good signal? I would say usually yes, but only if it's over about 50 or 100 grand depending on the size of the company. I think these token, <coughs> token director buys particularly where several directors all buy a trivial amount. I think Ed Roskill last night in our panel show said he actually sees that as a negative because they're trying to pull the wool over our eyes, basically. Um, the other thing I like, big director buys from directors who are not personally wealthy. So finance directors are usually not, not particularly wealthy. So if the finance director buys 100 grand of the stock, that's a pretty good sign, I would say. Um, point 12, I think we all like to think that we understand companies we invest in, but in my experience we really don't know what's going on. I think you only fully know what's going on in a company if you actually work there. Um, there are a lot of skeletons in the cupboards in lots of listed companies. So as a general theme, I think it's good to try and do digging on the internet and find information sources which are not the company itself. So there's a website I'm sure some of you looked at, I think it's called Glassdoor where employees comment anonymously about the companies they work for. Now obviously you're going to pick up a load of disgruntled people who've been sacked saying it's terrible, but you can, you can mentally sift them I think and if you see a common theme, I looked at one company the other day where it just everyone, all the comments said management don't listen, they, you know, and, and you think to yourself okay there's, there's, there's clearly some sort of problem in that particular company. Uh, David mentioned last night, very good points, he likes to talk to competitors and customers of the company and say, you know, in a roundabout way, what do you think about them? Are their products any good? And you can pick up some really useful information that way. Um, God, I've been going nearly an hour. Uh, right, better wrap this up, haven't I? Um, but, uh, I'll do these quickly. 13, being too cynical. I think we all are and should be cynical about a lot of stock market companies but I think if you're too cynical and you just dismiss everything you can miss some great opportunities. Some of my biggest profits have come from spotting an early turnaround in a company that everyone else thinks is terrible. So keep an open mind and be prepared to change it literally on a sixpence if the news flow justifies that. Um, change of FD and accounting problems. Recent examples, we've had several. Revolution bars, good business, but they cocked up their forecasting. Um, that caused havoc with the share price, uh, but there was then a bid approach. Um, I think bidders will come back for that, probably. 
Uh, Air Partner is one where they had accounting problems recently, and the share price halved and has almost fully recovered. So I, I don't think you can necessarily have one rule fits all. Um, the golden rule, though, for me now, with um, companies that announce accounting problems or change of FD, I think if it's got a lot of debt, I would, I would sell instantly. But if it's cash rich, it probably will recover. Um, IPOs, I think, just generally treat with caution. Too many companies uh, are floated on the back of a couple of years' good profits, and then things, we're the mugs that buy them off the owners. The owners wander off with their 30 million quid in their back pocket, and then the whole business collapses. Uh, you had that UP Global Sourcing, which was an example of that. N2 was another one, the high yield that it was floated with. The company went bust uh, not long afterwards. And so basically anything to do with the double glazing, I think, is best avoided. And, um, and again, where's the moat with that UP Global Sourcing? They were just buying stuff from China and selling to the UK. There's no moat to that. Anyone can do that. I dislike IPOs where the founders are taking out money as well. Um, the retailing sector, I think there are selectively opportunities there. But the key thing is to look for companies that are transitioning online successfully and that have short leases. So Next is my key pick there, that's doing very well. Um, their online business is now more profitable than their stores and it's on a PE of 12. Um, checklists. So I've got one checklist which I very quickly want to run through. I pity I can't put it up on the screen, but I, this is based on Mark Minovini, so, and, and I'll publish this on Stockopedia. So 12 key points I look for um, in companies. This is the last, last thing you'll be pleased to hear. So uh, the first one is product. So the product needs to fulfill an unmet need in cons customers. The product should be desirable and with pricing power. Second one, recurring revenues ideally, or at least not lumpy. Innovative company, which launches new products and services ahead of the competition. Margins should be high, giving operational gearing, um, because that gives you your big upside when sales rise. But it must have a moat as well, as we mentioned before. Entrepreneurial management. This is absolutely key, and I've learned from David on this. He, he backs companies where the founders are still big shareholders, and I think you just get, you just get better results from those type of entrepreneurial management. Um, scalable. So these days, if I'm looking to invest in a company, I want to be able to envision that company scaling up by five-fold or more. I'm not interested in companies that just tick along or grow 5% in a good year. I want, I want something that can really be a much, much bigger business in a few years. Retail roll, rollouts are good examples of that. Cloud-based technology can often be very good, um, and online retailers. Uh, organic growth is the next one. So strong organic growth, and pref preferably accelerating, not driven by acquisitions. That's key, what I look for. Assets, so the balance sheet must be strong. Uh, profitable or close to it. I very rarely invest in loss-making companies now because you just get diluted. They have to raise more and more money. It's, it's a bit of a mug's game, I think. Um, earnings estimates from brokers should be rising. So I love companies that actually beat uh, forecast results and where the brokers keep upgrading the forecasts because they tend to be too conservative and it's cheaper than you think it is. And finally, dividends are nice to have, but they're not, in, not essential. And the other things is, if I have any doubts about the business model, the management or the accounts, then I don't touch it. Uh, as I say, the main influence for that list is Mark Minovini, and I'll publish that tomorrow on Stockopedia, because I th it's, my performance has improved a lot since I used that checklist. And I think that's it from me, unless... Uh, does everyone want to get to the bar now? It's quite hot, isn't it? <laughs> <laughs> Shall we leave it there, Richard? <laughs> Questions. Yeah, I mean, yeah, if people I mean, want to. Right. We'll have five minutes of very quick questions, if that's right, because I know the bounty questions. Feel, off feel free, day. but feel free to leave if you, you know, if you're hot and bothered. Or... Okay, so let's do really fast uh, questions. Who wants to ask a question to Paul Scott? And do stick your hand in the air if you would like to ask a question. And don't be shy. There's a guy at the back, and then normally once we get one, the rest will follow. But we'll we'll do quick fire. All right. Okay. Yeah. Hi, Paul. Um, Communities, CMS. Hello. Oh. <laughs> Interested. To hear the shorts, reasons as to, as to why, yeah. Uh, well, it was really the, the, the impact, potential impact of GDPR. So um, the, the, the databases and so on might well be decimated. So I'm just really having a punt on their transaction volumes dropping sharply because of GDPR. Next question. Any more questions for Paul? 
<laughs> ah, great, here we go, another one. Uh, Neil, we'll just wait for the mic if that's right so people can hear. Uh, you've got the uh, next up there, and um, of course, a lot of its profits, probably now the majority of its profits, come from its, uh, from its digital side. But a, yes. lot of that, a lot of that is driven by the credit. Yeah, we, 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 we uh, talked about that at a previous investment show. Forward, yeah. you know, how, how that model is going to survive against the likes of Boohoo and ASOS, who, who are driving it, they're, they're a much lower profit margin, but actually that you know, clothing aspect part of it, mm. I wouldn't be surprised if the margins aren't that dissimilar to, to Next's underlying margin. Next is generating about 16%, I think, off the top of my head, of group profits. And the retail stores now, believe it or not, only generate about 37% of Next uh, total profits. And the, the balance being uh, the online, the, what, the old Next directory, which is now online. So, um, I mean, I think what you've got with Next is people perceive it as a, a high street retailer in decline. It's actually, you know, a very successful and growing online business with a, a sort of withering away of the shops. Um, which is not going to cause any problem. They're getting 28% rent reductions on lease renewals and they're only taking lease renewals on five-year leases now. So I think they're managing the store decline very, very well. And their online business is great and it's growing. And their, their overseas business is great. And the, and the, the financial business is, is holding its own. The number of accounts is roughly static. and Yeah, so I think all parts of the business are pretty good. Anyone else? Probably have to of the course they want to get, they want to, get uh, to the that bar. That was a sensational hour. <laughs> I was writing so much down. Will you please give a huge uh, round of applause to Paul Scott? Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.